We've got everything that we need on the planet at this time, but we just need to be able to cooperate at scale. Creating tr a truly decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distributed planetary operation system. The wealth disparity is the greatest it's ever been in history and it's only going to increase with automation until we have a different set of systems that actually create different incentives. Competition still and, and, and scarcity and really this planet has everything that we need and we just don't have the right infrastructure yet. As I have allowed my own uh, feminine to flourish and to not be shamed, um, my masculine is actually gotten even stronger. And when I looked at different religions and ancient civilizations, that there was a common thread through many of them. Boom. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site in Woodside, California, with an incredible team of humans building the future. We are talking to the New Earth Planetary Alliance. We have Amber, we have Christopher, and we have Ben. What's up, everyone? Hmm. How's it going? Hello, hello, hello. Super well, thank you. Yes, I'm super happy to have you all on the show. I'm really excited to unpack planetary architecture, the protocols we need to build the future. This is going to be a lot of fun. So I like to, I like to usually start off by asking about, you know, how you even got involved in planetary architecture. We'll have Amber uh, tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll jump into what exactly planetary architecture is, what these protocols are, and how to best move forward. So let's do it. You start us off. Yeah, beautiful. So, hmm, it actually began like this, <laughs> with my eyes closed and digging a little deeper into that inner knowing and exploring that a bit further. And that took me into understanding uh, the laws of vibration and frequency and light and continuing to explore that further into uh, what are known as the laws of creation and how I began to understand when I looked at different religions and ancient civilizations, that there was a common thread through many of them. And there was many ancient practices that I began to pick up and embody over the years of my research and development, which lasted for about five and a half years. And the, the common threads that I began to see we're beginning to correlate with the laws of creation. And the clarity that came through was that they all tie in to the laws of creation. And they were just different lenses to look at them through. And so that led me into astrophysics and interstellar physics and understanding the celestial harmonics of the universe and how that works with our brainwave frequencies as well as our electromagnetic fields and how deeply interconnected we are. Okay, now what you started unpacking there was this, these laws of nature, the reality of existence, how we live, what ancient civilizations uh, have known, what we know now and how to merge this, this oldness with this newness and have these uh, laws be really practically implemented and enjoyed and followed throughout our existence. So what are some of these ancient laws of nature? What are some of these laws? Yeah, so we have the, the law of polarity, the law of vibration. And when you begin to look at these, these laws and you really begin to look at the mechanics of how they work, you can truly see um, the, the mechanics and, and your reality creation. And let me see here for a second if I can. So the, some laws of nature would be things like the way that we perceive space time and the way that we perceive the DNA and molecules and atoms. Is this part of the laws? 
yes absolutely that's that's the deeper facet of of the laws of creation absolutely and then what are some of the the polarity and some of the other um, laws that you were speaking of earlier maybe unpack those a little bit for us yeah so the law of magnetism which uh, a lot of us are um, you know those who don't quite understand what the laws of creation are um, you know many people see the polarity in their life um, they see the magnetism in their life of how they're magnetized to certain people and projects or also not magnetized to certain people and projects and um yeah, it's... I'd like to see uh, if I can pass over to Chris and, mm -hmm. and Ben. I want to hear from you two about the... Uh, so just, you know, what is it about New Earth Planetary Alliance? What is it about these laws of nature? What is it about all of this that you want to, you know, bring to civilization? Just on a little bit of a grander scale before we unpack more of the nuance. Yeah, um... I mean, ultimately, it's about, for each of us, we're trying to figure out life, quote unquote. Like, we're trying to be like, oh, I figured it out, and then I want to tell you about it because I have a better life because I figured it out. And this is not at the level of the personal. This is at the level of the collective. It's how do we use these laws and uh, the understandings that we've come to to create a better system for humanity to co-create and actually build futures that we want to live into. It's very well said, yeah. And I think for me, the the law of polarity is one of the most important that we're all experiencing right now. I think um, the Me Too movement and so much of the rising feminine energy that I think we all feel um, is a response to a society that has been incredibly out of balance and incredibly polarized mm -hmm. society. And what the laws of nature teach us are the ways to actually come back into balance mm -hmm. that it's when these two forces actually merge into a form of sacred union that's when we can actually really accelerate our transformation um, and, and when both are able to play the unique role that they're there to play the light and the dark the male and the female we see this not just in you know our interpersonal dynamics but you know it's it permeates all of existence so when we bring ourselves back into alignment with those two fundamental polarities, then we can really unleash the creative potential of humanity, of, of the creative forces of life itself. Yeah, I like the way that you two just made a, a very, it was, it was really well put together, both of what, both of what you said. We had the, the, the polarity and the re- uh, equilibrium of what needs to be is making the co-creation to move forward. Yeah, I like that a lot. And so how about we talk a bit about these, you know, New Earth Planetary Alliance. We're wondering, you know, what exactly is that? We were talking a bit about, you know, these protocols. We we're talking about the way that um, we can actually do the creation. There are certain things that you want to manifest in the different communities to be able to do that. And you have these different accelerators as well, feminine intelligence. So tell us, about, start unpacking this for us. Yeah, so even going deeper into understanding the laws of creation, uh, each law has different principles that govern that law. And that's really where the, the, the deeper mechanics come in that we can begin to create protocols for. Um, and integrate them into our social innovation, technology development, and um, you know, biological regeneration, and things like that. So um, the principles around these different laws of creation, when we look to them, are really how, how nature works on this planet as well, which many of us are aware of that. And so when we look at the um, natural living systems and how they work, it's a very graceful, thriving uh, system. And um, when we look at the feminine intelligence um, energies and how we move through our interactions with more of the f feminine intelligence um, qualities, they actually correlate with the living systems principles. And so um, 
we really feel that that's that's what's missing in all this exponential innovation and tech. We have so many incredible minds. Um, it's mostly been men for many years, and we are starting to see uh, many in incredible minds um, coming from you know the the feminine intelligence side. And what we want to really bridge through at this time is is weaving that it's not just women, weaving through the masculine and feminine of, of our individual selves and really pulling that through so we can begin to um, scale that level of interaction uh, throughout everything that we do. That was, that was a good... Um those, that was a good way to put us into a context of there are certain social changes that we want to bring about and how exactly do we do that. And we started talking about the feminine intelligence, which is now coming into an equilibrium with a masculine intelligence, and it's looking to be extremely beautiful future um, of co-creation. Now, let's talk about the protocols. Yeah, I'd actually like to mention... Uh just a little bit more around like what that actually looks like yeah. right so um you know and even for let's just put everyone in the same field for a second you know uh, all men and all women um, that are pioneering the way today um, we're seeing a lot of the masculine approach to drive things forward to architect and engineer uh, to develop and let's let's do it and we're running out of time and um, you know, there's also a lot of um, competition still and, and, and scarcity and really this planet has everything that we need and we just don't have the right infrastructure yet. So once we have the infrastructure in place with the uh, right protocols in place, we can begin to open up those flows for optimal potential. And so what we're seeing uh, with the, the more feminine intelligence protocols is yes, we still want to drive exponential innovation, but we wanna do it with, with honoring what's coming through and how, how do we really honor what's coming through um, when working with these feminine intelligence protocols. And, and it looks something like, you know, let's, let's design and architect and engineer, but let's also take time to reflect and be with, with the information that we're receiving. Because um, a lot of times, if you um, are, are downloading lots of information and you actually take the time to step away from it, you'll begin to receive more clarity around what's coming through. Mm -hmm. And uh, moving through around the, co the cooperative aspect is that we'll be able to get so much more done if we open up the channels of communication and resources and begin to re uh, redistribute this, this planetary wealth, um, and not just meaning currency, but wealth and throughout you know, um, all aspects. So. Yeah, so this so well said, the abundance that is already here and that the frameworks are just not designed well enough to foster the full potential of what humanity can unleash. I love that. That was so good. And then I also really liked what you said because we now know I've talked about this enough that I've come back from my fourth 10-day meditation retreat. And when you go offline for 10 days and you go inward for 10 days, you would, it just, it connects so much of what you're building in new ways that you've never thought of before. And so it is so crucial to take time away from building and go inward and reflect. Okay, now let's, let's as, we talk, as we start doing some P2P, P2P peer to peer protocols and um, that architecture, maybe do you two want to chime in a bit on what was just discussed? I love hearing your thoughts about things sure. along the way. Yeah. Um, I think what's so beautiful about this unfolding is that we, the New Earth Planetary Alliance, is mod modeling what this balanced architecture looks like because we not only have the structural elements, but we're also creating the flow that moves through those structures. And for me, that flow is, this, is part of this cultural shift in the, the way that we're gonna shift humanity's consciousness and awareness to be able to participate in collaborative, non-hierarchical structures. Um, because so much is ingrained in even our own bodies um, 
with fear around scarcity, around um, you know not having enough, not being loved. And so um, Christopher and I are come from filmmaking backgrounds and art backgrounds, and uh, we make virtual reality. And so part of what we're contributing to the Alliance is um, creating the kinds of experiences that are going to be necessary to help people move through their own personal journey to be able to engage with these bigger systems. Um, because as, as above, so below is one of the, these other core principles that um, we see reflected throughout the universe that everything external is also contained internally. And so um, when we bring that into our awareness, you know, it, we really need to have both, uh, both these external structures and then this internal transformation work. And so things like Vipassana, things like the 10-day the meditation courses, which was a huge turning point for me personally also, um, we want to find ways to use these exponential technologies to create similar kinds of experiences for people that can scale, for people who might not be at a place yet where they're going to take that dive. The first thing that anyone ever says to me when I suggest that they should do a 10 day retreat, it's like, Oh, I could never do that. And, but can you do two minutes? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So can we give people the tools, um, to, to do that kind of work so that we can all come together in new ways from that place within ourselves and, and outside of ourselves. I like that the flows and the frameworks. So you said yeah, the frameworks that are built out and the flows of the resources through them. And then also you guys are going to be doing the journey for everyone helping make this content material that helps people unleash who they truly are into the world. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. To just piggyback on that. Um, a lot of what we see is that the distribution of resources comes down to this idea that there's winners and losers and that, Therefore, inside of our society, the wealth disparity is the greatest it's ever been in history, and it's only going to increase with automation until we have a different set of systems that actually create different incentives by which everyone can be, have their basic needs taken care of, which means they can care about other things than just the scarcity of today. And when that happens, that unleashes much more of this potential. It moves from egocentric to ultimately ideally a global centric of like how as humanity are we crafting and co-creating a future and what does that look like why is that important well it's important because of a lot of reasons other than we're destroying our future currently um, and many believe that well technology will come in and save the day and it's like tech is not a savior we're the ones creating the tech it's only a mirror of us um, but just bringing it back to the resource flow of it's when we get beyond our own need for resources for ourselves and our direct family that we come to start to understand how we can create a better experience for all because this is no longer tribe v tribe yeah. it's not that is not the needed aspect of surviving and so as we can come into that and realize oh we're while we each have our own individual belief structures, our own individual cultures, that that can live and continue on while also being part of a greater whole. And that's one of the aspects that we really focus on is how do we create those stories and experiences along with the protocol so that they're all supporting each other and not disparate pieces that are in silos. There was a, when you guys were talking to me yes, yesterday, two days ago now, and teaching me about the, about the experience of taking people to the, from Earth to the overview effect of Earth, and then going back into a specific experience on Earth. I love hearing about things like this because, again, you're really taking people to a place where they can see the wholeness of Earth and the community that is Earth. And that it isn't just me and my family, but it's me, my family, my community, the country, the continent, and the entire world as one as we move through the cosmos. And then as you started speaking, you went on the zero-sum game. And I love talking about that. It was a big part of the TEDx talk in San Francisco last month that I gave. Because if we view things in a scarcity mindset of zero-sum of things like attention, that it ends up catalyzing a 
competition of winners and losers versus the understanding of unlocking the abundance that we have that we can go out of this womb and get even further and more and love. Yeah, so there's so much there. Let's go into frameworks and protocols. And I would like to talk about how you guys are putting together those frameworks, what that looks like, and what are the protocols that enable the resource flow. Yeah, so I'd also like to bridge in what they were speaking around and how we have the, the structure, which is more of the masculine, and then the flow, which is more of the feminine. And then how zooming out to see the world and coming back in really puts um, into perspective the whole system's design lens, right? And that's really what's needed is um, for people to feel um, autonomous and embodied in their individualism, but also a part of the whole. And so that's a part of the application uh, development with the protocols is how do we how do we really bring that intrinsic wholeness state of being um, back to the forefront of people's reality and um, yeah the structure and the protocols what was your question and inquiry let's go let's through step into, that. step into that yeah, yeah. How, how how are you laying out the frameworks and how is the resource flow going to work through those yeah. right so um living systems principles of being dynamic and, and fluid and intuitive and adaptive and resilient and how do we how do we take um that and build it into um a system where we can cooperate at scale, which is what I keep pulling through, because this is really what's at hand here. I mean, we've got everything that we need on the planet at this time, but we just need to be able to cooperate at scale. And so what that actually looks like is people being able to come into the system and choose what sovereign governance model they want to use as well as what economic model they want to use. And so what we've done is um, we have looked at all the sovereign governance models out there today that are actually working within ecosystems. We've also looked at all the different regenerative economic models out there and really looked at how we can um, create the applications and the API for these um, different models to actually be able to communicate at a fundamental layer. And through that inquiry, we've come to peer-to-peer um, -peer protocols, uh, which mimic living systems. And that is going to allow us to operate uh, across silos. And this is going to be absolutely game-changing. Um, and a little bit more context of, of what that actually looks like in a cooperative ecosystem of many different organizations and many different creative minds coming together as human beings, not attached to technology, not attached to brands, but coming in as individual creative expressions of source, ready to co-create with each other. And that framework looks a little something as adaptable and resilient as um, many different, even old world economic models, bridge economic models, and future economic models working together. Um, there was a really profound <laughs> quote in what you sent me in the writing. Mm -hmm. It was actually, uh, part of the writing was Conway's Law. Conway's Law says, any organization that designs a system, defined broadly, will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Super well said. So the better that the frameworks and flows are designed, the better the outcomes will Absolutely. be. Absolutely. And, you know, kind of, I'm, part of my work is really looking at the meta architecture and then extracting it all the way down to the, to the from the as above, so below. And um, one, of those, one of those core facets that always keeps coming back um, is distribution and uh, signaling of communication. And so um, even when you look at diseases of like cancer and such, when you really look at, at, a, at a biological and cellular level, it's, it's really the, 
the flow of energy is being stopped and it becomes incoherent. And now the cells are not communicating and now you have cancer, right? And so that's what's happening on our planet is we need to just open up the barriers of communication, open up the barriers of how these resources can be distributed so we can begin to remove the cancer of the planet. And uh, this is just mm -hmm. super critical. And how does that happen? What, is, what does it look like for peer-to-peer? -peer? It's literally membrane to membrane. So every single node in the ecosystem, from one node to another, right? So from one being to another, there's a membrane there. Now, from one being to a project, there's also another membrane there. Mm -hmm. And so every single uh, interconnected point has a membrane with the other point. And this is where we can re really begin to work with the precision of the distribution of communication and resources. Thinking, thinking about it as like a collection of nodes, which are these individuals or these projects that we're building, and then the membrane being how to communicate between to that node, actually get to that node, what is that communication? Now, real quick, what was the study of the governments uh, and the regenerative economies um, that you mapped out, and then what did you figure out from that that is going to be your a way to get through these membranes and to make the protocols? Like, what did you figure out from all that? Yeah, so I figured out that through the gov so it's a bit different, obviously, between the governance and the economy. Um, around the governance, when I look deeper into it, is actually different levels of consciousness. We're using different governance models, and so we want we obviously have different levels of consciousness on the planet, and so different um, beings and ecosystems will will choose depending on their level of consciousness. But since we're in an evolving time, very rapidly, um, the system needs to be able to co-evolve with the consciousness, and and create you know more adaptability. And so um, that's been the biggest thing with with governance. And that when we looked at it from a peer-to-peer -peer perspective, we we saw that actually all the other governance models were more. Um, deeper frameworks for people who needed more structure. The less structure you need, um, the more that you don't have to go through so much processing to Bureaucracy, get to a Bureaucracy, red decision. tape, everything yeah. that holds back innovation. Truly, yeah. truly. Yeah. And then you get to, to this really beautiful place of Three just, million page tax codes or whatever it is. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's really... It's really wild just how, how in depth, I mean, just even, you know, Holacracy, which is a really amazing one. There's thousands of organizations um, working with this platform, but it is like, there's a lot of structure to it. And for me, I'm just like, wow, it takes all that to come to a decision, you know? And so when you break down having to use um, this level of structure, you really start beginning to work with the mechanics of the laws of creation and it's really more around um, vibrational law and frequency and and how how that works so now that you're aware of peer-to-peer -peer protocols uh, we now need the the infrastructure that also mimics nature and the digital environment to um, be able to um, work with those protocols and be able to scale them so uh, we've been working with some pioneers and digital technology architectures, and we are um, building holonic architectures for this to begin self-organizing into. And what does that mean? Uh, this means that it, it is infinitely replicatable and infinitely scalable, and um, the back end of it is using uh, geometry to do this. Infinitely repeatable, infinitely scalable. Infinitely, infinitely replicatable and infinitely scalable and also self-healing. So as nodes begin to break off and not work with one another, it just creates another geometry, right? Cool. Mm -hmm. cool. And then that's what's going to enable the communities to speak, these nodes to speak through the membranes. And yeah, because it's so evolving and... You know, there could be three nodes at, w at one point communicating. There could be 300 nodes communicating. 
and um, how that how that all needs to be extremely adaptable and able to continue to to evolve and the biggest thing around this is like if this is um, the very fabric of existence um, from atoms to galaxies um, we, we might want to start utilizing and integrating that intelligence across all scales um, from digital to social to ecological and beyond is that then that all the communications are are infinitely replicable is that what this is that what this means that there is a, like multiple ledgers of this yes yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify a little bit for those who aren't familiar with Holonic architecture, um, essentially it's a fractal patterning of um, decentralized, non-hierarchical collaborative systems. So think of them as these, these membranes, these circles within circles connected. So you have nodes that are all playing different functions within the system and no one node is in a hierarchical position above another node and so through the peer to peer protocols we can create this ecosystem of collaborative structure where we don't need hierarchy and so the feminine intelligence accelerator is one of these initial holonic systems um, that's currently made up of these six entities and 12 individuals who are modeling the effectiveness of this kind of structure. So um, we're a non-collaborative, we are a collaborative non-hierarchical ecosystem in that we share resources with one another. Um, as our projects overlap, we're able to bring each other in into those membranes as appropriate. And what we're modeling through the Feminine Intelligence Accelerator is that the value created in this system is exponential. Um, that when we remove the barriers that competition creates, we're actually creating the opportunity for value to accelerate. And so we're, we're going to model that through this initial prototype so that we have a use case that anyone in the world can look at and see, you know, even just from an old world um, wealth generation perspective, we're still out, we're going to be outperforming these hierarchical competitive systems. So a couple things. Um, first is I really enjoyed reading over some of the material that you have all already created. Um, the, I, the idea of these, like things like this inclusive design protocol, you actually go through, is this needed every single time you design something into the world? No. But is it a general framework that is less than a couple pages long that helps people go through this process of discussing ideas, designing the ideas, deciding on those ideas, and then reviewing how it went? Yes. And that's incredible. And just to have this down as a process that can go into different um, areas. So, th so these are the types of, of, of protocols, these types of systems that are going to go through the framework. And again, the framework will enable these communities to work together and individuals to work together. Yeah, yeah. And yes. then I want to go over there. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So I just want to say one thing about the inclusive design process. This is one process of, of, a, of a few different blueprints that we're working with. Um, at a peer-to-peer -peer level, right? So we have minimal structure. Uh, I like to call it enlightened structure. And no, we don't use these every time. Uh, we, we come into deep resonance and deep alignment and deep coherence, and that's more of uh, the alchemy that we use to come into decision-making. So literally, our structure is three steps. How aligned are we? How aligned are we? How much resonance do we have in the container and how much coherence do we have in the container? So we move from that space. And any time that we feel tension or we're not coming into agreement on things, we look at it as creative tension instead of something is wrong. Um, and so at that time, we'll try to work through the process. And if we feel that we need to bring in some, some structure, we will go to a few of the different um, inclusive design frameworks that we have. Yep, mm -hmm. beautifully said. Now, may I have some uh, thoughts on the last part from you guys about frameworks, flows, the protocols? Yeah. Um, I think an important aspect of tying these pieces together, both from 
the aspect of the laws of nature of like as below so above um, and also designing these protocols and the quote that you spoke to is ontological design mm -hmm. is this aspect of the things that we design design us so until what we really stand for is that the internal world that we create for ourselves first is the most important aspect because that's what allows us to know that what we're going to create is going to be amazing for everyone as well as for ourselves. And so by doing the internal work of destructuring our own mental models and understanding how we're perceiving the world, we're then able to design from that aspect to allow for others that possibility of freedom and awareness around the way that they show up in the world. Yeah, I think um, there's a, a woman named Benita Roy who um, is a really incredible metamodern uh, thinker and um, she describes this creative process as um, whenever there is a tension or something that's out of alignment, um, listen to what the other person is saying as though it was your own voice. Mm. And these are really simple tools that can really bring us into a state of coherence where the the conflict is actually just adding a, a dynamic perspective that it really enriches our ability to understand things more fully. And so w when we, it's very important, it takes a lot of, um, I mean, I've spent a lot of my life working to get to a place where I am able to, to deconstruct and reconstruct my mental map of the universe more um, quickly and, and effectively. Yeah. Um, but when we, when we have access to that technology of, of, of our own creation, um, we can come into a state of coherence with community. Um, and so that's, that's part of what, with the tools that we're creating or um, experiences that um, bring people into that state of, of sort of non-dual consciousness or non-local consciousness where um, I realize that I actually am not separate from you. And, um, and when we can operate from that place, um, that's what gets me really excited. Yeah. Now, yeah. I mean, one aspect that, I think you just really spoke to is this aspect of so often we fall into this world of, Oh, you're different. So we just want different things. So like the outcome that we're trying to go for, like I'm going for something different cause I'm different than you. And therefore <laughs> we have an impassable conflict <laughs> yeah. rather than this nature of like, oh, based on the incentives and the belief structures that you have, you're looking at this from a different lens. Let me try on that lens. Yes. Let me see how I can step into that lens and you do the same for me so that we can see where is the miscommunication occurring that we can actually then sit there, speak to that, and then digest it and be like, okay, we do have different outputs that we want. What is the most important output from this interaction that we can create and then that way there's steps forward rather than this impassable conflict of no, I want my way, you want your way, we're different. And that's the end of it. So the impassable conflict. Yeah. How many times do we see that? We I also made that extremely prevalent uh, in the talk uh, that I gave at TEDx, just the, the binary trap that we get into. And then the, also the, the ridiculousness of thinking that we have the truth, when we only have our lens, but then when you wear all the other lenses possible, you have a better understanding of the truth and they don't become impassable. They become passable. They become mo moving forward. I want to, I want to, I want to actually get a little bit, uh, uh, I want to give an example. So will you give us an example of what will happen once the infrastructure is in place, the frameworks and flows, yeah give us the example yeah yeah that's actually what i wanted to speak on next. Great. so um what does that look like for everyone else once we start uh, rolling out the the system and the infrastructure um it's it's gonna look like well it's gonna be gamified and it's gonna be integrated with the participatory what we call a participatory action platform 
So think about if, um, for instance, many people are aware of Guy MTV, which is really pushing conscious evolution and um, have just, you know, all walks of consciousness can go there and um, explore enlightenment. And uh, one thing that's missing is w where can people plug in and be interconnected with that information? And so that'll be a huge part of the integrated platform, the integral platform, where people will be able to come on and, and learn and be able to choose how they want to experience it. So yes, we are uh, developing these meta narratives in AR and VR and mixed reality, but that doesn't mean that that's how you have to choose your experience. So we're really looking at um, all levels of participation and all walks of consciousness will choose many different ways of how they want to uh, plug in. And so that's a really, really important part if we're going to be able to open this up to all hearts and all minds of, of the planet. And um, it will be tied in, of course, with the, the governance and the economy. And you may say, well, how do, how do people who are not so enlightened or not working with uh, higher levels of consciousness be able to understand uh, you know, inclusive design processes and governance and economy. And um, we have leading experts uh, that will be working with us um, to, to bring that forth into uh, the gamification and, and user experience part of this. So then, yeah. you, Would you, you like to yeah, share some yeah more go on for that? it. There's um, some really interesting things that happen with value flows when these kinds of holonic systems come online. Um, because when you have these self-organizing structures um, that are participation-based, so if you think about it in terms of cells in the body, um, you know, I might come to the realization, I'm a heart cell, so I'm going to get together with some other heart cells, and I have my membrane around me, but then I'm part of this greater membrane that is the heart, and we have a function, and within that context, we can create our own self-organized forms of value flow so we Which can the heartbeat for yeah the body. exactly yeah. and different ways of sending signal different ways of sending signal internally and externally and so one of the things that i love to think about is um something that amber introduced me to the idea of tokenizing gratitude mm -hmm. that um we can actually create our own currencies that allow us to see the flow the currents of these value exchanges in ways that are multi-dimensional and monetary currency is a single dimension it's a way of exchanging value that you know is really is a sandwich worth the same amount as a back rub like how how are those values correlated um because they're so experiential and so personal and so as we create these systems that are self-organizing and we can create our own value flows within those systems, um, we're going to be able to much more effectively move value um, and really see what is valuable to our communities. Um, and that, that's a concrete example to me of how um, these different ways of visualizing value will create that, those more effective ex forms of exchange. So then what does, what will it look like when uh, someone comes online to your infrastructure? So yes, we have these experiences that onboard people into the, into the, the most really mm -hmm. profound senses of unlocking their full potential and consciousness and contribution. Mm -hmm. But then what actually occurs when, you know, you were making this example of, okay, I am a heart cell within the heart community. So you are a cell within San Francisco or London or Hong Kong or wherever you're at. And then, so how do they begin to use the peer-to-peer -peer protocols within other people in Hong Kong? How do they work with San Francisco, et cetera? Tell us about how they would use the infrastructure for that. Yeah, so um, there's there's going to be pluggable, plug, pluggable protocols. So everything that we're working on, the back end that is, um, you know, hyper complex, where because we are working um, with the as above, so below principles and, and uh, many others, um, it's really going to show up for the user experience and, and the most simple way you can imagine. So um, that, that's a part of the intelligent design behind this. And people may say, well, gamified. Well, not everyone wants things gamified. Well, just even taking the agent-centric uh, gamification 
uh, design principles and integrating them into applications just as as your phone, you know, we can really begin to um, utilize it in, in that way as well. So let's go through an example of I'm in San Francisco, I want to become part of North Planetary Alliance, I want to start working with the community on a project through your platform, and then I want to see what other people across the world are also building in their communities. How, how would that communication work? Yeah, so I think I need to bridge through at this time that um, New Earth Planetary Alliance is really a steward of these protocols and, and codes and is also um, architect, helping to architect and develop and engineer um, not only the protocols but also the information architectures and data structures for the system. And this system is not New Earth Planetary Alliances. We are stewards of, of um, weaving this together and, and orchestrating the facets. Um, and so then other is, people are within yes, the community absolutely. are building out the protocols that will then open up. So Hong Kong may make its yeah. own open source protocol and San Francisco may make its own open source P2P protocol. And yeah, then so the, the, the thing with P2P protocols is that you literally can scale it from um, an individual uh, to a nation. Right, so these protocols work at all scales. Um, that really goes back to how adaptable and resilient uh, these protocols are. And what, what we're actually working on is um, more of like a global, how the global nervous system of intelligence will work. So we have mm -hmm. many other ecosystems working on many other parts of this. And um, how that might look for um, you know, people across the world to plug in to the new system is through semantic coordination of the data and the evolving fields of collective intelligence through um, a cognitive assistant. And so I feel that that's more along the lines of, of how um, this information will move across silos. So tell us about the cognitive assistant. Yeah, so the cognitive assistant, this is really something that we've been, we've been looking at deeply as well as um, how can we uh, distribute information and resources uh, more quickly, at, at, so to say at a quantum, a quantum rate, um, but also, and so utilizing exponential tech like artificial intelligence, but really um, infusing it with biomimetic protocols. So that way um, the technology is there just to help us orient and is not there to take over our lives or make decisions for us. And so utilizing the quantum capabilities of artificial intelligence infused with biomimetic protocols will um, pretty much, you know, bring everything that we need right to right to our, our, our phones. So the cognitive assistant enables me to more easily do what I need within my life, the community, the world. Yeah, so it'll aggregate the, the information um, based on what you're inquiring about. So whatever you need or want or desire, it's gonna bring you those people, places, and resources. Um, and it's gonna bring them um, to you in a very intelligent way so you can further inquire deeper um, where you might want to plug in with those pieces that, that you're looking for. The cognitive assistant works with the different hubs across the world, whatever protocols they have yeah, written. Yeah, yeah. And then, so, so these are your partners. So associative net networks. So, yeah, um, the protocols networks. are basically working, th working with what we call associative networks. Um, so that could be um, an individual known as an individual agent in the system, which that individual agent has um, data um, uh, around um, what they're doing and, and what they have and, and where they're going, right? And then also uh, the group agents as well. And so each of these are associative networks. And um, through the through the peer-to-peer -peer protocols, the associative networks um, can communicate at the fundamental layer um, to scale um, across silos, right? And so this is a really, really important um, facet that when we begin to scale um, fields of super intelligence, so to say, fields of deep neural networks, right, um, that actually when we talk about transforming the planet at some point, these networks will need to communicate at some level. And we're able to do that through these peer-to-peer -peer protocols um, where we'll be able to come into a um, 
unified conceptual space in the digital realm or otherwise known as a unified space memory network. And um, that will allow us to aggregate information from many different associative networks, creating tr a truly decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distributed planetary operation system. Love it, I love that. And th that does move us away from silos, which it looks like everything is moving away from that towards what you just described. Now, <clears throat> will everybody have their own cognitive assistant? Mm, yes, as they choose, right? So some people may not choose to do so, but they're, you know, then okay. whatever they have ac access to will be obviously m much different. So, um, but it is, it is our goal to provide uh, this level of, of technology um, to, to all the continents. So um, what that might look like is we really are looking at it uh, once again, as a whole systems design approach. So therefore, we're not just looking at technology innovation and um, you know AR and, and VR and gamification. We're also looking at it from the um, permaculture side of things and, and uh, built environments and urban redesign. And also, um, you know, countries that, that don't have um, the resources and how can we uh, get them the resources um, in, in a very quick way. And so we do have plans um, to even drop ship shipping containers with distributed tech, um, including 3D printers that can um, print villages in a matter of a week, um, you know, farm in a box, uh, water, water purification systems. And, and so we are planning to really um, drop into a planetary operations yeah uh, at this level yeah yeah that, that that's really interesting how there's a lot of different partners involved with that are all building the future in these different ways and they all want to decentralize what they're doing and they all want to be a part of a network like this and that's good okay so thoughts from you too <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean the immediate thing that just came up for me uh inside of what we're speaking about is everyone thinks it's the muscles that move the body like and to me the muscles in our system that we're looking at it from are the silos and it's actually the way that the muscles connect to the bones and it's the connective tissue throughout your body that is some of the most important tissues in your body because none of it can work without those connective tissues and so that's really what we're speaking about is how do all of these different pieces connect because we all want to be doing things in an integrated way yet for most of the time especially when we are uh, masculine driven we come head to head and when we're coming head to head we're not connecting and i think something from before that we were speaking to around the feminine aspects of this is that when you, you know, there's been studies shown that when you empower women in, uh, you know, in poverty situations, what happens versus when you empower men, mm -hmm. when you empower men, they make money for themselves, put food on the table for their family, and then go spend whatever money they have. When you empower women, they actually bring up the whole community they actually are set up to like the way that they care is beyond just their immediate nature of like right here inside of this pod. And I think that that is one of the aspects of feminine intelligence that we really look to bring into both technologies and also these protocols of how do we, uh, how are we connecting together rather than how are we, you know, as you spoke to like the zero sum game, how are we, winning versus at all costs. And just to add to that, I, I think um, there can be this gut reaction to hearing something like that. I, I, I at various points in my life would have reacted to feeling like the, the masculine is, is being vilified in this moment that, um, and yet that couldn't be further from the truth that um, as we come into balance internally, at least I, I would just speak for myself, as I have allowed my own 
uh, feminine to flourish and to not be shamed. Um, my masculine has actually go gotten even stronger and really learning what, what are the, what is an enlightened masculine? What is, what is a healed and whole masculine energy? Um, and what kind of, um, contributions does that energy have to have to bring to the whole? Um, and so I not to center it on the masculine because I think we are moving in it's we're rebalancing the system and we've been in an, in this very imbalanced masculine phase for a long time. So it's like, we don't need to go there. But, uh, I do think just for any men listening, it's not that you are wrong. It's not that, um, there's anything wrong with masculinity, except that it's out of balance. And when we come back into balance, the characteristics of the masculine that really, um, can contribute to this planetary awakening are being, are holding, are, um, creating semi-permeable boundaries that are not rigid, but are flexible and being able to be strong while being flexible so that we don't create these rigid systems that, um, you know, we can feel it in our own bodies. You know, I, I, I we all carry that tension with us of, of living in a society that's this out of balance. And so how do we, how do we find that flow state where we're, um, we can hold effectively while being flexible and allowing things to inhale and exhale, expand and contract. Um, these are the, these are these core principles. In inhalation and exhalation is another one of these core natural principles that everything is constantly inhaling and exhaling. And, um, and so we don't need to fight that. We can, we just like move into a space of allowing, um, Yeah, so I'd really like to touch base on um, allowing and how important um, th that is for all of this. And, and it really comes through as one of the feminine intelligence principles of receptivity. And you would not, you would be so surprised how many people are willing to give and take, but actually do not know how to receive. And that is a part of the heart and how it speaks and interacts. And so really bridging that through at this time and, and the receptivity is just super, super key for catalyzing transformation. So just tell us a little bit more about that. Giving and taking has become quite easy throughout society, but what is this allowing that you speak of? Allowing, yes. Yeah. So there's there's different levels of allowing and receiving, just like I've come to find different levels of presenting. And the more you can be open to receive, um, the the better the better tools you'll have um, to to navigate. So this can the this can be like uh, we were talking about earlier. If you can receive someone's lens that they see the world with, you will have a more true lens of the way you see the world yeah absolutely and so um personally uh, coming from so much fire and so much information and just wanting to like you know get it out and share with people and be like oh my god this is like so amazing do you, do you guys understand what's happening and and then realizing that people weren't able to really receive it because I was just talking to so many different walks of consciousness and I began to understand that it was better for me to first inquire to the field and see where they were at and then respond. Um, and so that was a huge part of really being able to receive the people that were in front of me first before I just tried to you know, um, distribute any information. And that, yeah. that's been a yeah. huge part of more people being able to receive what's coming through because it is um, a very different way of feeling and thinking and being than what this planet is used to. So as we go forth and change the social context that we live in with these frameworks and these flows and a uh, new earth planetary alliance, I am very looking forward to what comes up. How do people end up working together? with you? Well, we do have membranes that we are creating. We're getting ready to model the first prototype um, through an accelerator 
that is um, called the Feminine Intelligence Accelerator, and there's six different components of that accelerator. Um, but I think I'll move back into playing with New Earth Planetary Alliance, and, and that, that'll kind of bridge in, um, yeah, both, both contexts. So um, people can get in contact with us through wearenepa at gmail.com, and in the coming months we'll be uh, opening up a public communications channel where uh, many people can come through and, and uh, start to interact with, with the council and other people who are inspired to co-create with us. Awesome, that link is in the bio, the email's in the bio. Um, okay, great, so that is really looking forward to people reaching out and also the communications channel opening up to co-create and build the future. Um, I think what we're hoping to do now is um, create a model by which other people can take it and, and run with it. And, um, so in the near future, as these systems come online, there will really just be a template where if someone wants to get involved and create their own accelerator, we will have all of the protocols in place where you can take that entire toolkit and adapt it to your community, your passion, whatever it is that you're here on this planet to create, you'll be able to use these tools. So, um, yeah. headquarters yeah tell us about that yeah. tell us yeah. website yeah. and RFI. yeah so the feminine intelligence also has a website it's currently being updated and you'll be able to go there to see the development of this prototype um, we'll also be we are fi uh, we are the fi Com. We are the fi .com. We are the fi .com. Links in the bio. Yeah. And we're looking to open a feminine intelligence headquarters in Spring in Venice, California. And um, this is where we will be doing testings of these protocols uh, with exponential technology and the meta narratives. Uh, so the accelerator is around transformational media and tech and how we can start utilizing this new um, cooperative ecosystemic uh, framework with um, the yeah evolution that that's that's coming through and, and ready to shift the planet and we we really are seeing this as a safe space for other innovators and pioneers working in this field to um, ha have a space that they can um, come and play with with this level of knowledge and, and energy okay let's wrap up uh, by saying thank you thank you for coming on the show Thank you for talking to us. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I feel very blessed to be with you all. And that what you're building is extremely important. And keep building. Keep building. Keep building. We need you. We need you. We need you. And I'm glad that we started unpacking this. This is just, you know, interview number one uh, on all of this subject. So we have a lot more to talk about. As it keeps unfolding, we'll continue doing media content about it, uh, pushing that out there. So be ready because the next time there will be more created. There will be more to talk about. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, please... Next time we'll do a demo on the prototype that we're working on. Exactly. So we have a de there's demo coming up. There's so much to showcase and talk about and unpack. Really looking forward to another one soon, another conversation soon. And leave us your thoughts in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear from you on all that we talked about. So give us your thoughts. Uh, go and build the future. Manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Much love. This has been going great, by the way. Great oh, job, good, everyone. Good, good, yeah, good. great this job. Is, yeah. This is the first time I've ever yeah. done. I'm yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Great work. That feels super good. Yeah, <laughs> great work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew it was gonna go great. <laughs> nothing, nothing, not nothing that I interview ever goes bad. <laughs> <laughs> we'll really see. You have a magical. We'll gift. see. It's, we'll it's see. Really I'm glad we'll you see. found your passion. It's like the surgeon that's never had someone die or whatever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> The hostage negotiator that's never lost or whatever. Yeah, really we'll see. Thank you. The most beautiful burden that you carry very lightly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eventually we'll lose one, but it'll be. Uh,
the storm out there like you're too equanimous i'm out of here <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I can, I can tell how much time this is going to take me to edit yeah let's yeah it makes us look skinnier <laughs> it makes us look skinnier <laughs> yeah if you go higher it does <laughs> okay. One one silly one. All right. All right. Silly. <laughs> 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 <laughs>